welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this Saturday afternoon. My name is Sasa Kayinde. Uh, I am here with Mr. Va, also a former diplomat and Arthur on all things in the Great Lakes region. I'm going to let them introduce themselves further, let us know uh, where we can read more about their work, etc. Uh, Mr. Celestin, if you can begin, please. You're just unmuted. Unmute yourself. I uh, thank you. I'm grateful that you introduced introduced me to participate in this conversation. I'm Celestine Sengiumba. I uh, I'm a former diplomat in Addis Ababa, the hub of the African diplomacy. And um, I now live in the um, uh, northwest of the state of New York. And I'm delighted to be part of this um, of this exchange. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Bahunga. Yeah. My name, as you said, I'm just in Bahunga, a former diplomat. I live now in the UK. And uh, I'm so glad that you, ha you have invited me to this conversation and together with my brother Celestine. I hope this will profit other people. And I think really it is important to mention this. And I think the audience, the English audience, is so important that to think mm -hmm. of addressing yourself to it is equally important. Yes, thank I you. To agree. Thank you. Thank you. So today's discussion, we're uh, going to discuss about the ongoing crisis in Eastern DRC or the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo, previously also known as Zaire. Um, it's very difficult to separate the history of Eastern DRC from the history of Rwanda. Uh, but today we're going to try to speak uh, speak about the, the, the ongoing war or the return to a hot war from what seemed to have been uh, a period of stability and peace. Um, so historically and culturally, most people don't, well, I think most of our viewers would know, but both Rwanda, Burundi, and Congo were at a point colonized by the Belgians. And that within that, um, after the um after African nations became independent, we then see um a fracture or a separation of what was really one linguistic family or a group of people within the Great Lakes region who had natural borders, uh, but those borders were, were were cut up once colonialism ended. So um, if you could both give a sort of quick summary or your thoughts on how the colonial period um, plays a part to our current problem, particularly in the question of borders and what is Eastern DRC and what is Thank you very much indeed. I think it is quite important that you ask that question because it will help us to understand what is happening today. As you will recall, when the colonial powers started to partition Africa, most of the regions were still in a state formation process. Mm -hmm. And you see when, for instance, the current government says in Rwanda that we ought to occupy to be part of Congo and part of Uganda, actually is misunderstanding the whole process or dynamics of history at that time. Because like in Europe, the you know, actual issue of state, it came about in 1461, no, no, 1641, and with the conference of West Safaria. Otherwise, you have the King of England having a right to the throne of a certain kingdom in, in, in France. We had about this 100 years war, we have got 30 years war. And at that time, that you had now to set borders. So in Africa, it is the same that in the Episcopal region that when 
the, the colonial powers that came, they found the, this process of state formation, and it is them that said, now, these are the borders. Mm -hmm. And while doing it at, at, at the Biden conference, he's like sharing a cake. He's just cutting this in my piece, this the other piece, this the other one's piece. They didn't take care of, of tribes or the groups which went across the border. I'll give one simple example. There was part time, a time in Uganda at the border with Kenya when you had brothers, one an MP, a member of parliament in Uganda, another mm -hmm. member of parliament in, in Kenya. Because yes. after the border with the countries, we have got different farms, one part in Uganda, one part on the other side. And that's for that reason that in 1963, when Organized African Unity was set, the charter said clearly that we cannot go back to question the boundaries set by colonial powers. Well, they knew there would be a problem. People decided to say, this is mine, this is across the border. And this brings me to a very serious uh, question about, about Rwanda. So if I go very far, is that in 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 two thousand in nineteen ninety nine, the uh, Organization for African Unity commissioned experts or a panel of uh, quite eminent personalities to to say to write about genocide in Rwanda. In the sixties, in it in nineteen ninety. Two thousand, they urged African leaders that they are anxious of the doctrine of Rwanda, of present current government in Rwanda, that feels it can intervene in other countries to support what they consider to be their king and the kids. That's two thousand to twenty-four years ago. So that's to show the problem with the border. Now, if we came, and then we come now to, to Congo and Rwanda, again, I think it's one to, to point out that on the border between Rwanda and the Uganda and the, and the, and the, and the, and the Congo, which was there at that time, the issue remained the same, that at the time of the colonial powers coming in, we had the people of Rwanda and what you call speaking the same and the same ethnic group mm -hmm. on both sides of the border. And it's important to note that the Kinos Kivu, where, the, where there is a problem now, the area of Uluchuru and the Masisi, of between 60 and 80% are, are people who could say, of Rwandan origin, meaning with the same, the same culture, but with the same language. And and the, the other tribes, which we we'll call the, the the other three uh, tribes, Nandi, Unde, and Nyanga, they are minority. It is in mean, Rwanda one to three. And those oh. people of Rwandan origin are both Hutu and Tutsi. But unfortunately, we see that the people of this, but that's what I have to know. And by the um, way, this area, this area of northern Ki North Kivu is twice the size of Rwanda. I think people have to know. Rwanda is uh, 6,038 square kilometers, whereas North Kivu is 59,450 square kilometers. It's more than twice. So when you're not to speak of the war, I think it's better to know the size and how how the population that lives there. Hmm. With that in mind, and, I was wondering and, uh, if I could just sorry if I could just cut you off. I wanted to bring in Mr. Sengi Yumva here with with a with a little Mr. Bahunda uh, summarized us about the particularly the the history of the Berlin Conference. Uh, who would you say are some of the important regions, players in the region? And uh, how has how would you say history uh, that Mr. Bahunda just shared with us molded these players? Um, um, thank you. The, the main players um, uh, in, involved in this um, 
region or in this crisis uh, as we speak are not only the 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 peoples or the government of Rwanda and the Congo we have four um as Bahunga said we have also uh, we are still in in a state of uh, in a situation of state formation mm. it is still going on in the region and our leaders are still learning how to be between universal commerce national leaders national mm -hmm. leaders and uh, that is a part of uh, of the problem we are facing because um um our leaders who are still uh, uh, learning how to be national leaders uh, get involved in flawed political processes which produce mm -hmm. which produce leaders uh, or government leaders with no or insufficient um, legitimacy so that um at the end of the day, you find them. You find our leaders just fighting to keep themselves in power, mm. instead of fighting their way to leave power into the hands of other leaders, mm. into the hands of other products of regular political processes, uh, so that. Um, that would be my, uh, my my assessment of this situation, whereby we find that Rwanda is involved in the crisis in Eastern Congo over the minerals of Congo, but Rwanda has no mineral industries. We, mm. don't, we don't have we, we we don't have manufacturing industries. So these minerals uh, must be ferried to wherever they they, they need to go to the north. That is to the mm -hmm. west, and the interest Rwanda has in the, in all this process is that the West would protect the leaders. That is Rwanda and Congo. The the the, the West would protect the leaders' flawed elections. Mm. Uh, the West would approve, as they did recently in Congo. They would ratify uh, clearly flawed and um, illegal. Uh, illegally organized uh, electoral processes. We, we saw it very recently in Congo. Um, the West came in unison to ratify the election of the, the, the president of, of Congo, today's president of Congo, uh, ignoring, totally ignoring the the, 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 the the opposition people who were crying foul. And, and um, so, so now he has the, the, the president of Congo, has mm -hmm. said interest in going along the, I see. the, the lines, uh, along the wishes of his sponsors, as does the president of Rwanda. And this is, uh, according to me, this is really part of the... regular political processes. Mm -hmm. if, we could, if we could have no rigged elections. If we could have national governments, the crisis which is uh, now raging in, in, in Eastern Congo would not be there because the leaders would understand that the best interests of our population lies in cooperation and peaceful mm -hmm. existence. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I want to bring back Mr. Bahunda. Uh, when you first started speaking, uh, Celestine, you, you brought in foreign interests. Um, there is something I often think about, but I don't know if it's too simple minded. But essentially, I when I try to explain to people the connection with Rwanda and Congo, I tell them, Habiari Mana said no, but Kagame said yes. But I can't quite tell, expand to them what the yes or no is. Um, so M Mr. Bahunda, what is the current state of diplomacy or and uh, military affairs? If you're able to, for example, uh, give us a quick summary of that picture in the last maybe 10 years and how it has now resurfaced again. And so if you could tie, yeah, the state of diplomacy, military affairs with the foreign uh, foreign interests that drive all this. 
Yeah, I think uh, I think this issue of of what of the what we are seeing. I I look I, I call it a tip of an iceberg. Meaning, actually, it is something just on the surface. Are you hiding something bigger than it is? Why is that there's no way you can explain, for instance, that a small country like Rwanda, which is depends 43% of its budget, is funded by the state. 70% of, of public expenditure from outside the aid, it can afford to invade, occupy a country which is 80 times bigger than it is. By the way, Congo is of 2.4 million square kilometers, while one twenty-six thousand square kilometers. As I was saying, even the North Kivu is twice bigger than Rwanda. So if it you and also for, for historical records, Rwanda ha invaded Congo twice together with Uganda. First of all it was with the Burundi and Uganda. Second phase 1998 that was with Uganda. And and the two the two invasions cannot we cannot attribute them Rwanda and Rwanda, Rwanda go away with the, the impunity unless there are some external forces which are behind Rwanda. Even this war, you have seen that the, there was the the US in the National UN Security Council has clearly stated that Rwanda has got troops in the Congo. That it supports a UN sanctioned the group 23. There are no, they, you have no sanctions. And you ask yourself, what, what kind of power, what the first one can have to defy with impunity the instruction, the injunction of the, of the United Nations Security Council? Coming back to that, but we come back now to the now to the to the to the uh, to the to the crisis, there's what they call. I think the first time you quite we talked about it. What we call transnational war economy, meaning that government officials collude with rebel leaders and businesses to loot mineral resources of a country to sustain the war. And what is sustaining because these groups are not interested in having the war end. Mm -hmm. I remind you again that in 2001, there was a report on looting of Congolese resources. And his conclusions that at 85 multinationals in the DRC, 57 companies and 29 individuals as well as the Congo. So the war, wow. in essence, I got the international dimension which 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 now nah, which Celestine talked about, but there is also the regional dimension of having Uganda, especially in, in Rwanda, exploiting the resources of the DRC. Mm. And this also has been has been documented by UN. So these issues, I mean, they, they are, they, and again at the local level, again, mm. as I was saying before, there is the local businesses that deal fraud, with the fraud in the minerals to one and Uganda. I was seeing that, for instance, I was saying the the UN treasury for two thousand and twenty one. That ninety percent of the gold of Congo goes through Uganda and Rwanda. Wow. So this interest, oh, and this interest, and but, but so there is the local element of local politicians. That's what we have to say. Five, five local militias, and these belong to local businesses and the politicians. 
who use them as the leverage to have part in, in Kinshasa. So the leadership, I was going to ask, so the leadership in a sense has turned the crisis into an economic system. No, not, it's, it's not, it's not the Rwanda and Uganda, we may Burundi, I think a little bit, but international level, these multinationals that actually exploit the resources with the Congo and use Rwanda and Uganda as a conduit. And indeed, this, this report, the UN report says that Rwanda has become, and Rwanda become a gateway to outside the markets of these resources. And not only that, recently, Kagame was on record saying that these minerals pass through our country and they have a problem, they are doing of that. But he said, even if I allow them to go through, I would have a problem. So mm -hmm. what I want to say is that this war in this time, in this time Congo has got the ramifications is exploitation of the mineral resources of, of Congo. And the people involved, the stakeholders, I was saying, the locally, local, we have got to local authorities, local leaders, who have got, have got, and the businesses, who have got their personal armies. And they bring mm. to the question, now we come to government, the issue is that normally the, the sign of a state, we're talking about states, is that God has got the monopoly of violence over the other, the other, the other sources. So meaning, what is happening now in the Congo in terms of the local level of government is it has no control over its territory. And therefore, it's created a vacuum for this small, small group to take over. And of course, which are being used by neighboring countries for their, for their economic interests. I know what I mean okay. is, 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 is clear. Thank you so much. Um, so, thank you so much. For, yeah. Oh, sorry. I thought. You had another so, point so, to what, what say, so what, what I was saying is it's very important that we see this connection mm -hmm. that this economic factor, what you call what we are called the transnational war economy, which profits and this is being facilitated by the absence of the state of of the of DRC in certain areas. And I was listening by very interestingly to the Minister of Industry of, of the Congo, who, who was the governor in the Kivu for 12 years. And he was giving an example, which is the same thing that I say, the absence of the state or the absence of the instruments of the state, that's the police, the army, and the judiciary, mm -hmm. and leaving everyone to look after themselves. And he was giving an example saying, for instance, he was saying, you know, well, they had this one policeman for 156 kilometers, square kilometers. Whereas, for instance, the problem with Rwanda, where you have gone, we are 26,000 square kilometers, but we 33,000 soldiers. Mm. I notice the so, difference. So, the, the, the effort of the government now, for the Congo now, the key issue. We are saying is it is now to, to make the government present in every area an effective way with the police, with the army, and with the with justice. Thank you so much. Uh, with, that, that, with that in mind, I just wanted to bring in Mr. Sengi Yumva in. And I wanted you to sort of add if you had any comments to add about the political economic relationship. Um, I like to I like to always think of things in historical terms. And after liberation, Africans were free of neo colonialism. But then straight after we jumped into neocolonialism and neoliberalism, when I see the ongoing crisis of Congolese minerals, it is really tied to neoliberalism and how much more the first world is more and more dependent on the resource of the third world, cre cre creating a system, like Mr. Bahunga said, of uh, trans, you know, transnational war economy. Here in Canada, we call it the Mickey Mat, the military industrial congressional 
uh, something, something. But it's a really, it's a big industry in which war is the main theme. And so I wondered uh, in your history, especially if you could, if there's a way to explain Habir Mana said no and Kagami said yes, um, the minerals still existed during your time. Why was the exploitation not quite um, as apparent? Yeah, oh, no, it interesting. was. Um, um, it was, it was. Um, uh, I think I, I need to, 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 to remind you that um, when Congo became independent in 1960, the then commander of uh, the Congolese army, which was called the First Republic, uh, wrote on the blackboard in front of his office, he wrote that before independence equals after independence. That is basically meaning that, in fact, nothing has changed. Only the flags mm -hmm. flying <laughs> mm -hmm. things have, have changed. Uh, and um, um, in the in the 60s and early 70s, Congo was a booming economy. But Congo was about to achieve industrial stability. And uh, the, the, the Western interest could not allow that because that, that would give Congo a say in the bargaining, in the bargain, uh, while bargaining the price of copper or cobalt, and they started sabotaging the, 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 the mining industry, and uh, it collapsed. And as it collapsed, it denied the government the resources needed to be present on all Congolese territory. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the issue of the absence of uh, government of um, predicated on the insufficient government resources to be present in, uh, in, 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 especially in, in the North and the South Kivu, but also the incentives received by um, the governments of Rwanda, Burundi, and Uganda, the small countries neighboring Congo. The, the other countries, Congo has about, uh, I think, nine or 10 neighbors. They are all uh, large countries. Right. Zambia, Tanzania, Angola, these are large countries which cannot be influenced as easily as Rwanda uh, and mm. it can be. And um, the other small country is Congo Brazzaville, which is a preserve of France. So the, 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 the open areas for foreign influence are Rwanda and Burundi, who have structural weak, structurally weak. Mm. They cannot balance their budgets. So they need budget assistance. And this assistance comes with strings attached. attached. Okay. And uh, so that is part of the, 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 the what, what is the, what is the uh, encouraging instability in, in Eastern Congo. And um, uh, also we need to, uh, bring out to bring out the the, the fact that uh, um, you know in my first um, intervention I spoke about the political um, political processes mm -hmm. now we have we have been uh, seeing talks between different uh, stakeholders mm -hmm. uh, and process Nairobi process the main the main factors driving instability are absent in these negotiations. And these, these um, stakeholders are the powerful Western interests. They need to be around the table for, for this. Uh, oh, so if I, might, if I might, if I might ask you a question on that, you're saying no matter how many talks between Congo and Rwanda themselves, if the foreign interests who, who are behind the scenes uh, pushing everything are not sitting at the table as well, we cannot have a peaceful solution. Or we cannot but, easily find solutions. Yes, yes. Because okay. uh, you see, um, Kainde, when um, these, I, I can call them puppet government, because they, yeah. you know, we know how they come into power. The moment mm -hmm. they don't deliver the goods, a leader gets overthrown. 
it has happened to Mobutu, it has happened to Habyarimana and, uh, and Kadyamira and uh, all, all these people. It has happened to President Laurent Desiree Kabila. The, if you mm. deliver the goods expected to run Western factories, they get rid of it. And they, they find somebody in your country. Uh, the offer that is mm -hmm. to be helped into state power is to take into state house on the condition that you promise to do their bidding or their willing. And uh, with the understanding that the moment you are, you, you are not delivering the goods, you are done. They can get somebody else. And the instability we are experiencing, it is not um, that we, we Rwandans or Congolese um, like to get to each other's throat. No, uh, there are very strong incentives and um, peace cannot come about if the, these powerful interests would not want to let go of Congo and they mm -hmm. cannot. They cannot because Congo is- um, They cannot survive without Congo. And Congo would survive, but it is a reservoir of. Mm. No, I meant the Western, the Western foreign interest. They cannot survive without the raw materials from the Congo. Exactly, exactly. And uh, uh, at the end of the day, the, the question is, the question becomes, what do we close? Do we close our factories? Or mm. do we have a regime change in Kigali, yes. in Kinshasa, in Bujumbura? This, this is mm -hmm. the question. And uh, we cannot resolve this question without the, these powerful Western interests around the table. Thank you, thank you. Um, with with that with that uh, in mind, I do have a question for Mr. Bahunga. Uh, we've we've all been today. We've been speaking about this concept of state formation, and uh, the more you've spoken, the more I understand that the leadership is almost co opted, or the leadership class in the region is co opted. But I want to know how can you create healthy nationalism within the everyday people on the ground because so many successful revolutions have required the everyday people to see themselves as part of that change. Currently we have like tribal, you know, there's a tribal theme within this conflict that keeps that apart. But how do you see um, a peaceful solution for me requires the people to be woken up and for them to understand their value, not only in their land, but in whom they are and their cultural history. So, um, I suppose that's my question. Uh, how can we create healthy nationalism in the Great Lakes region to, to fight this economic warfare? Thank you so much. One, I think the question, if you allow me to answer, which is why I answer this question, said, why, I think we have Yarimana and we do something, but I think the, the, core, the key issue is that we have also to understand the question of the Great Lakes region and the impact of the end of the Cold War. Ah, yes, yes. During the Cold War, there was, for instance, the Congo was used by the West to fight the East, which was supporting Angola. Ah, yes. And so, when it ended, then the issue was about human rights, democracy. So Mobutu was no longer useful for the Cold War. So they asked a question on him about human rights. And I tell you one thing: that there's one, the ambassador of the of UA, of the US ambassador Richardson, when Kabila was well, has had been to Kabila, it was Rwanda. And he said, he told Mobutu, he said, it is time over. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be pulled in the state of Kinshasa. Can you please leave? And he seemed to have said, it's written in the, in the book, the content for the taking. He said, we have worked together for the last 25 years. Are you now dropping me now? They said, yes. And then the head of security was God in Rwanda. He made his counterpart the CIA and he asked him, How would you drop us for a communist like 
like a kabila. He answered him, he said, who told you he's our friend? Because he was, he was there for one year, replaced by his son. And for Rwanda also, I can tell you for Rwanda, and see, if you look at a report of the World Bank report in 1989, Rwanda is taken as a role model for good management of the economy. But then the time had come to change the political configuration of the of the against the, the region. And of course, Abdi Aliman was not ready, that's what I think, to go along the way and or moving probably Mobutu or collaborating. So there was a force for the RPF. We had co-opted, which was eyeing, I think we are just a collateral damage for Rwanda, but over but the next, which is the, which is the Congo. So that's 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 and that's that's the link. So why? And because the, and because the, the manner of dealing with friendly policy is different. Mm -hmm. For Habjari Mana, it was rather cooperation other than aggressive occupation. You remember during the time there was CPG and, and I'm, I'm so I was so glad since I talked about it recently. Mm -hmm. The economic committee of Great Lakes, which was Rwanda, Burundi, and Israel at that time. And one of the issues was to agree on free movement of people and goods. Well, those also formed what the KB or Kajan River Basin Organization, where we had Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, and Burundi. So the, the whole policy was different in the sense that while the present government said we have to go to defend our as agree on free movement of people and goods. When it came to, to, to economic cooperation, it was let us we, let us have free exchange rather than saying let's go take over. So that's the that's the kind of the big difference, the foreign policy of Habyarimana and the foreign policy of the present current government in Rwanda, which have the even in claims, is that some parts of Congo will be a part of Rwanda, as I was saying, want to establish the borders between the two countries. Now, you are asking me now, what do we do to bring that nationalism? I think Congo is people have actually underestimated the national spirit of the Congolese. Not only Rwanda, but also the Western countries, they used to say that Congo does not exist. All the tribes live next to another. And, I'm, and I suspect, I suspect, that when Rwanda went in, what they had in mind from the very beginning, to take over Eastern Congo balkanization. And there is some element to it. Because you we I was reading that the the, the advisor or the Arsenal Secretary of State for Africa, Walter, during the time of, of Bush Jr., he was saying that Congo has to, has to be dismantled. There is another gentleman called Ambassador Peter Palm. He is he was he was up he was in, in 2012 when when uh, M23 attacked for the first time, wrote an article New York Times saying that that was to save Congo exit for a part. This gentleman came to be the special envoy of the U.S. appointed by Trump from 2018 to 2020. Mm -hmm. So it's, there seems to be a kind of, I don't know whether it was a deal with the RPF project, and some of the some of the people in the West who thought that actually Congo better be managed 
if it was if it fell apart. The Yugoslavia and, method. And, and I think and I think now the, the, the people didn't expect Congo to be what it is. And again, when you come to the in the Congo, as I, as I was said, I was saying the two invasions of Congo by Rwanda and the Uganda, 1996, 1998. It, it was it was a crime, it was the war crime. No, it was not a war crimes, but a crime of aggression. Mm. Nobody ever questioned that. And actually, when the Congo sent now wrote to the UN, they wanted to they table a motion to call Rwanda and Uganda aggression. Remember, they had called the forces of Zimbabwe. They refused to, they, I think, UK and the US to use the word aggression and they use mm -hmm. the word in the post colon, invited the forces and uninvited the forces. That's what, they, <laughs> that's what it was. Yeah. To avoid calling it aggression. So, the, but the point is who actually, first of all, who funded that? And who it wanted to have the capacity two years after 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 the after the war to have that capacity. Mm -hmm. Now, as I was saying, so, so and then since 1998 up to up to this day, the, there has been a kind of a policy of the neighbors of Rwanda to keep it unstable, finding those small groups, including M23, which happened in 1998. Was up to, up to come of when Kabila sent away Rwandan forces. They formed LCD, that's Assemblement Congolais pour la Democracy, which was replaced after when they didn't work out by Saint DP, Congrès, Saint -Dep, National pour la Defense du Peuple by Nkunda. When they didn't work, he started in 23, which is actually. All these are emanations of the manipulation of the Rwandan government to keep control of that area. And that's how we have to see how to see it. Now, what I'm saying Thank now, you. what I'm saying actually, that's why they were saying, and I, that's why I'm very glad about, about what, what they have to do. I think I'm I'm very glad that the authorities in the Congo now to say understand the stakes at play. I told you I was I was I was listening to one of the ministers saying actually the key issue is not to bring people from from outside is to have is, is to have the the presence of the state instruments of power in every part of the Congo, which was been lacking for the last twenty years, and that's why you see the formation of the new army, professional, well paid, and big enough to control the area. That's the, the second answer, which, which I think is up to now. When during the, during the war, the security was voted 23% of, of the votes. Whether they agree or not, but at least they, nobody contests that it was the best, the, the best. And it was on the ground that the half the uh, Congo DRC must regain its power. Must again, it's, it's actually its image must be restored, hmm. and and I think they're working on it. Change in their pride of being Congolese, and that's why I had asked that question because I can see that there's a change in the steps of building nationalism and building uh, direct cooperation with the state within uh, Congolese society, I see. So thank you very much for that, Mr. Bahunda. I wanted to ask Mr. Senkiyu for the exact same question about creating healthy nationalism, but I also wanna add with Rwandan's history uh, of historical aggression towards Eastern DRC, are they ever at risk of having that reverse balkanization happen to them? More and more as this goes, I really do wonder, not only will the conflict spill over Rwanda, but does Rwanda risk also losing some of its territory if a nationalism can be created that unites both the people in uh, Western, Western Rwanda and the people in Eastern DRC? So those are my two questions. How do you think the spillover would affect Rwanda and how can we create a healthy nationalism for that region? 
Um, Ms. Kainde, before, before going into that one, I want to give you um, uh, um, yeah, of a scale of values, of labor value, um, which drives violence in Eastern Congo. As you know, many factories um, in, in North America have moved to Southeast Asia in India and Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 labor here in America is $15 an hour, and uh, that amounts to $90 a day. When you move the factory to Bangladesh, the, uh, the, the labor is paid $2 an hour, and uh, if you count eight hours days labor, that makes $16 down, wow. down from 90. Now, if you, you take that to Eastern Congo, where you have child labor, where you have forced labor, and where you have uh, non-industrial um, extraction of minerals, hmm. you get a value of $2 a day, two dollars. Oh, wow! Day. Now, from ninety to two dollars a day, you see the, the the powerful forces, labor forces, which drive violence in East Congo. And uh, with that in mind, Ms. Kainde, the president of Congo is unable to um, to remove the incentives which are which, which are being given to the small. East African um, states of Rwanda or Burundi or Uganda to, to uh, um, stop violence in Eastern Congo because the president of Congo cannot, he cannot offer conditions um, which are, which would cost the West less than $2 a day. And would that lead him to what you were saying, how if a leader does not uh, deliver, he is removed? Of course, of course. But when, when he cannot deliver, um, the, the, the West would drive in social unrest. And mm -hmm. you know how it, how it ends. Uh, social unrest usually removes the government. OK? Now, um, co concerning the, the Rwanda's ag um, persistent aggression in Eastern Congo, as I said, it is driven by unseen powerful hands and uh, the risk for Rwanda are there. Um, if, if, if another more powerful hand can help Congo to drive Rwanda out, I don't think the world would stop at the borders. And uh, Rwanda is not a, a large territory. It is, um, as Justin has told us in this um, conversation, North Kivu itself is about three times the size of Rwanda. Three times. Yeah, that is absolutely more than two times the size of Rwanda. So um, Rwanda can lose it, even its its nominal independence in the process. If, if, um. if Rwanda gets conquered, um, it can lose even its nominal independence, and that would be a disaster uh, for, for, for Rwanda and for Rwandans. And for the entire region, um, my, I'm concerned that the, the international community is not paying enough attention to the international, um, to the humanitarian crisis, which is, has befallen uh, North Kivu. They have about 2 million displaced persons. That is um, about the population of Toronto. You know, well, as you speak for this, let me bring you in another question so that you can uh, round it up. But why does the mainstream media seem to overlook the humanitarian crisis? You just said 2 million people. And it's reminding me about how the news cycle right now is constantly speaking about Gaza and their lack, you know, their famine and their in siege. But the people of Eastern DRC are in the same conditions. What do you what do you believe is the reason why there's never comparison to the crisis in Ukraine and Gaza, as you as you were headed there? Uh, it, it's because they, they, it would be uh, you, you want to have the West shoot their own feet. Uh, they, they would not. <laughs> yeah, because they, they control the media. Yeah. They control the media, and um, they cannot um, be um, crying foul to what they are doing in 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 Eastern Congo, encouraging violence for for profit for profit. 
and um, it, it appears it appears that uh, the, the the predicament of black people in Eastern Congo are not valued enough, like say the population of Gaza mm -hmm. or the population of Ukraine, uh, because these people have no role. They have played no role in um, bringing. They are peasants, farmers. They, they just mm -hmm. they just grow cassava and beans. And uh, but many of them don't know that these cassava and beans and crops are sitting on strategic minerals. They they oh. they, 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 they don't know. They, they are not aware. And uh, the, the least they deserve is is is, uh, is compassion. And um, I, I would That's want the, the West to show themselves to be. Much, much more compassionate about uh, the plight of these people who are victims. And also, uh, in order to end this crisis, to accept, to accept kindly, to accept mutually beneficial exchanges. That is, mm -hmm. to value the minerals of Eastern Congo at their real value instead of. Yes. Instead of uh, taking these minerals on looting or pillaging conditions, uh, that is what I need to say about this one. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, uh, Mr. Bahunga. Same, same to you. Uh, I just wanted your your comments on how you see any spillover into Rwanda from this crisis, and why again, why the humanitarian crisis is not uh, the mainstream media ignores it. Your point of view, please. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think there are two things. I think the, the issue of personalities. Mm. It is a possible, not even a possible, but the personality is actually quite important to analyze their characters, to say J.D. and Kagame. I think there is, I tend to think that, and he says it publicly, Kagame, that the fear, well, if, uh, he likes war. There is an expert party. Oh. And whereas for Chisechedi, he says, if I can avoid the war, I'd better not do it. So and there are two two people who are completely different. One who enjoys fighting, who doesn't care about the loss of lives. If he did, he would not, he would not care, he would care about what are dying in the Congo, in the war actually happening now. So one way, I think many, many, many Congolese would, would say that, and I think he agrees also, he will not have peace in that part of Africa or the region when Kagame is still in power. There's a conviction about that. So Baba say, some are saying, why don't you walk over when you can? Because I think he's in the process of, of training a, a real professional army. Or, and act next Rwanda. Pure, pure and simple. The other, the other dilemma, the other option is why do you help Rwandans help themselves? But well, they say you can't import, can't export the revolution. And and there is the people who say who suggest that they say the level of tyranny reflects at what level. their freedom and then to make necessary sacrifices to get that freedom. So how do we meaning actually people are saying why don't we are wondering themselves do that and do it. But I was saying there are two options. Some are saying we don't know which was going to win. Well it's a JD who says let's avoid what you can and probably help change happen from inside other than ourselves. What do we all say? Let's walk over and end the and end the problem. That's the, the first part of the question. The second, I go further and say the catastrophe in the Congo. You know, according to the official fig figures, by I heard from the president himself, more than ten million people have died in the Congo because of this was nineteen ninety three. Ten million. That's that's the population of of Congo, Mauritius. Botswana, about about five or six countries in Africa. 
And you have 7 million internet displaced persons in the Congo. 7 million. Mm -hmm. And which have been added, these, the, the numbers that that uh, President was talking about, is for this, this recent, recent displacement caused by the, by the current war. So the, the, the other point is saying, why the West? What, what do Africans know about this? What about mm -hmm. the media in Africa not talking about it? Because of some of the people, and actually that's the, the key, one of the key problems, that the killing, when in the West see that, and the Africans are not reacting, today, up to this day, I haven't had an African country condemning the presence of Ghana troops in the Congo when there's all elements, evidence to show it is happening. Mm -hmm. I don't have to hide. It is, it is the US, it is the France, it is whatever, even if they help. Why is not happening? So it comes to a point saying, at the end of the day, Africa don't care. Life don't, 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 don't matter in their way, in the value system. And you know, one time, M70 said, I mean, I don't agree with him on everything. He said that Africans, when they say that Europeans bring us to problem, he says, I blame uh, Europeans. Is it is like somebody who's the market gets drunk, and on the way he sleeps on the on the on the wayside, and the and the thief comes to take his wallet. Hmm. Then he goes home and tells his wife. He said, "My dear wife, I was just having a rest, and the someone threw, took my wallet." <laughs> he said, "Of course, feeling is bad, but you cannot tell me." that sleeping on the street is okay. So I it to you for some time. I thought I would send to you before to play it about Congo. He said in the African in general, why do we lose 10 million? And by the way, the 10 million who have died in the Congo is equal to the number of slaves that reached the United States, that were just America, wow. the same number, and took that 10 million was over three centuries, 300 years. The 10 million today is only in 30 years or 25 wow. years. And it doesn't make headlines in African press. It doesn't make headlines that the OAU, there's no condemnation. And as I said, actually, I would definitely say those are the theme. They should not. They don't care about human beings. But what about Africans? African leader, African, African people. Why it doesn't arouse that sympathy? Even when, like that's the European saying, people volunteers going to fight in Ukraine. How many Africans I heard you say? Let us go in the support and end this war in the Congo. So yeah. I agree that you should not, but at the same time, these things cannot happen. These minerals, we are taking these minerals. And we go through which country? They both are saying middlemen are Africans. And I sometimes mm -hmm. compare them to, to during the time of the slavery. It is African local chiefs who went to the villages, captured. African. So, so the responsibility must be shared. Yeah, you were cutting out a little bit, but keep going. Yes. Okay. So that's, what, so that's what I'm trying to say is that I agree with the suggestion that actually the most parents will do something, but we bear Africans bear a lot of responsibility in what is happening to them. Thank you very much. And so the in the Congo is a shame. What I mean, is a shame the one to African, to humanity. That is happening. People can just sleep and feel that it is okay. And they started blaming someone else. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um with with our closing thoughts on this, uh I do really want to thank you. I 
I encourage a lot of Ron young Rwandans to always look at Congo because I don't think we can separate 1990 to 1994 from what happened. That statistic you just shared, Mr. Bahunga, is really disturbing. 10 million slaves over 300 years versus 10 million Congolese over less than 10 years or 20 years. Very, that, very that, disturbing. 1993, yes. About yeah. 30 years, yes. Wow. Um, there's something Mr. Sengiyumba said um, that rem actually reminded me. He's talked about getting mutually beneficial systems or... Uh, Uh, approach and I'm not saying that BRICS is the answer, but um, as a as their face is this concept of mutually beneficial contracts, mutually beneficial states working together. Uh, you have this, I have that. Let's exchange so that both our people can be strengthened. And so that is also what I really believe. I think Congo is sitting on wealth, and that wealth requires, you know, mutually beneficial partners who will. Who will work with them to either create industry to empower their own people? Yes, yes go ahead. Actually, it is in you know the uh, when you speak of the West, I think it's all have to be very fair. All these businessmen, if they be the West or East or North or South, they are the same. Mm -hmm. You know that now when you went to the contact which was made between the DRC and the China, there's so much corruption that mm -hmm. the president said that his government has had to go and negotiate some of the contracts. Wow. People made the millions. And even in now, these minerals, of minerals, the names which were identified, you had the ministers, and the one after the minister is state of security. Wow. And I think that has put on anti-corruption group. But the point I'm making is that we have not to choose masters, but to be independent. We go down and say, let's leave the West and go to Russia. Let's go to China. Yeah. The business are the same. You have to you have to be able to negotiate. And negotiation, it will be, I think he said, he said, he said it in saying you again, let's say it is accountability. Accountability can only happen with the democratic system of government. When the population can vote, they are leaders to accounts. If it is not there, they will steal. You have seen even even the developed countries. You, have, you remember Helmut Kohl, Helmut Kohl or the, the the most the famous German who ended who actually who is identified with the end of the code of the of Berlin Wall. He was caught with I mean he was corruption. I think it was the Prime Minister mm -hmm. of Japan. The only thing we can help stop these natural tendencies is having strong institutions which make leadership leaders accountable. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, any other closing thoughts you have, Mr. Bahunda, and then we'll pass it on to Mr. Singhuva as well to give us some closing thoughts. Yes. One, I'm, I thank you. Thank you. What I was saying is that you have to remember that what is happening in the Congo is a tip of an iceberg. Meaning, actually, it hides a lot of hidden interests, both local and uh, local politicians who are not who are self who are hungry for wealth at the expense of their countries. We have got a regional dimension of countries around which across the systems. Eighty-five multinationals in the Congo that almost control their governments because they are the ones who finance many times the leaders who to get into power, and that's the only the way to do it is to have systems of government that are accountable, that people can bring them to account. You cannot change the natural tendency to steal or the greed, but you have can put the systems in place which make it more difficult for them to steal. And if they see they're stealing, they, 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 can't get, they can't get away with it. I think that's the way. And for Congo, what my personal assessment when I follow the Congo is that for the last 30 years, there's no, they didn't have a national army. 
They're making it now. There was no president of the state. As I said, one minister was saying it. So what they're trying to do is, how do you create this? Trained, professional, and the police to occupy the space. But in the sense of, 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 of government institutions, people would look for, they would lose this vacuum to create their own army that is happening now. But also, as he said, I mean, they, they said, actually, he was saying, what they want to do is saying, what they want to do is to have an army in such a way that any neighbor will know that he is messed up, messes up with us the, in the next 48 minutes, which I mean, it's capital. Mm. That, that's the only, that's the only way they feel, as the government feeling in the Congo, they can defend themselves, not depending on SADC forces, uh, East African forces, or mercenaries. They are conscious of that. And I think, and I'm hopeful, that this can happen. It's good for, not for the Congo, because I've had some tweets from our fellow Rwandans saying, why are you defending Congo? Why, why when they're criticizing Rwanda, I do for one thing. I defend human beings where they, where they are. I kiss a thief yeah. or a criminal, whoever he is, whether Rwandan or Congolese. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Singiva. Yeah, um, you you mentioned uh, toward the end. You mentioned the BRICS. Um, I strongly hope that um, these um, Eastern blocs, China and uh, Russia, and uh, probably also India. I strongly hope that they are not trying to create for themselves their own constituency, uh, mm. a rival of the Western constituency. As you know, uh, there has been uh, in the 70s, in the 80s, there was the non-aligned movement, which was eventually kind of dismantled because uh, toward the uh, end of the 90s, there were Uh, the Eastern Bloc had collapsed, but now um, I really hope that the the the, the emergence of BRICS is 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 an an a, a cry of revolt against unfair, unequal uh, conditions of the world, as dominated by the West, and as dominated by today's system of the United Nations. So um, the, uh, the, the strong desire of um, less powerful nations, like African, yeah. African nations, it, it would be uh, to have a world which works on principles of fair conditions of exchange, mutually beneficial conditions of exchange, and the end of block dominance, that is, yes. Either the West or the East. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to be dominated. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we don't want yeah. to dominate. We don't yeah. want to. Dominate. So that, that is a, that would be my conclusion on, on, on today's talk that um, we uh, look for a world which would be organized around mutually beneficial terms of exchange. Thank you, Mr. Thank Faith. You. Thank you. Thank you so much. I feel like I learned uh, quite a lot from both of you today. And there was really themes of taking responsibility and stop seeing ourselves as Africans as victims. Uh, we do have a part to play. And so long as we're victims, we're always going to be waiting for a savior. So I think that's a really big lesson for people my age group. Uh, and then I also wanted to mention somebody, I, I forgot which one, mentioned how the end of the Cold War really changed things for the Great Lakes region. And that point, I keep coming back to it, is really, it's so true and it's very powerful. 1990, the collapse of the Soviet Union, the end, even the fact that we just had two blocks and forcing the world onto one block, we now see the consequences of essentially having no option within a system. And that is also what I'm thinking about uh, when I think about the future of the Great Lakes region. Um, 
hopefully one day I do get a chance to go there. And all I can think of is, yeah, we do deserve a chance to actually build a state, a nationhood that is safe and that is for our people. And I think we, people like you are a treasure because you pass on a lot of knowledge to people my generation. And we really thank you for your time and your contributions for, for everything. Thank you very much for spending your afternoon with me today. And thank you for everyone who's watching. Uh, please like, share, and subscribe to your friends and other <laughs> others who have questions about the crisis in Eastern DRC. So thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, Kainde. Thank you so much. <laughs>